Coming up on Lafayette Lens, we span the spectrum of autism. One in 68 children are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. We sit down with families as they share their stories of what works, what doesn't, and what they see as important going forward. We'll hear from medical professionals on topics like genetics, legislators on policy implications, and professionals who are transforming the lives of those with the condition, and more. It's all coming up right now on Lafayette Lens. Thanks for joining us on Lafayette Lens. I'm Faven Regursa. And I'm Jen Bogner. Lafayette Lens is a co-production of PBS 39 and Lafayette College Policy Studies Program. Over the next 30 minutes, we will explore the world of autism and investigate its impacts on policy, technology, and education. But first, we turn to reporter Ed O'Brien to learn how many people are affected by autism spectrum disorder. Ed? Thanks, Faven. I interviewed Dr. James Copeland, a retired board-certified neurodevelopmental pediatrician who has worked at facilities including the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Here are some of the basic statistics about the prevalence of autism. According to a 2012 study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, ASD is found in 1 in 42 male children and 1 in 189 female children. This works out to about 1 in 68 children. And by the CDC's estimates, ASD had more than doubled since 2000. The prevalence of autism among today's 70-year-olds is almost identical to the prevalence of autism among today's five-year-olds using current diagnostic criteria. Dr. Copeland has a possible explanation for the increase in prevalence. Over the years, the cutoff for autism has shifted and shifted and shifted, and our, our concept of what the condition consists of has broadened so that we're picking up more people. Specifically, more people on the high-functioning end of the spectrum, according to Dr. Copeland. Under current diagnostic techniques, he says almost 2-3% to of the population will have some features of autism spectrum disorder. With millions of Americans affected, we are seeing a heightened focus on this disorder. Thanks, Ed. Is autism mostly a domestic concern, or is it a global issue? Reporters Adi Mehta, Emma Ray, and Katie Kidder compared autism rates around the world. Today, 1 in 68 children in the United States have been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Using the same protocol to diagnose autism, the incidence varies widely across the globe. In Taiwan, 1 in every 355 children is diagnosed with autism. In Venezuela, the incidence falls to 1 in every 588 children. And in Oman, the incidence plummets to 1 in 10,000. The stark variation across the countries has attracted the attention of researchers hoping to understand the causes of autism. But Professor Roy Richard Grinker, author of Unstrange Minds, has a different perspective. Professor Grinker is an anthropologist who examines cultural views of disabilities. He explains the differences in the number of reported cases of autism another way. He argues that in some countries, behavior that would lead to a diagnosis of autism in the U.S. is perceived as typical. His conclusion is that if we were to adjust for the diagnostic differences, we would see the true autism rates consistent over the years and across cultures and closer to the rates reported in the United States. If Professor Grinker is correct and the rate of autism in the U.S. roughly applies around the world, then there are 70 million around the globe who have autism, making it an even bigger challenge. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Katie Kidder with Addie Mehta and Emma Ray reporting. In April, Lehigh Valley landmarks were washed in blue light to recognize World Autism Awareness Day, along with landmarks in 156 other countries. I recently attended an event for autism in the Lehigh Valley. More than 5,000 people gathered at the Steel Stacks in Bethlehem on April 16th to raise awareness for families affected by ASD. Autism Speaks, an American nonprofit, hosts walks like this around the nation. So it's our job to help bring education, to help bring resources, to help those families make it through their day to day activities and provide the best life possible for their loved ones. Autism Speaks and Gibbons elaborated on the Lehigh Valley's commitment to this goal. We've raised millions of dollars in the Lehigh Valley 
and we invest that in scientific research, family services, advocacy at the state and federal level, and also to raise awareness of the disorder in the community. The movement to support this cause started small. Ten years ago, volunteers in this community, families affected by autism, came together and started this walk. So this year our goal is to raise $375,000, so we do that as a group. We do that. all of these people that are here help contribute to that. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Jen Bogner, reporting. Thanks, Jen. Now we explore how autism is diagnosed. To learn more, we're joined in the studio by reporter Beatrice Gassner and a special guest. Beatrice? Thanks, Jen. I'm joined with Dr. Anne Maduri from the DuPont Nemours Children's Hospital to talk about the procedures in diagnosing autism. Dr. Maduri, thank you for joining us. Nice to be here. I'd like to begin by asking what behavior parents should look for that may indicate that their child is on the autism spectrum. So some of the early signs that parents can look for are delays in a child's speech development, um, difficulty maintaining eye contact, lack of connectedness with their family members, decreased interest in other children, um, also repetitive behaviors that are different than what they might observe in other children. And how are parents involved in the diagnostic process? So we really rely on parents to help us as they know their child best. Um, and so we often ask parents a lot of questions about their child's early development. And um, certainly if parents are concerned, they should raise questions to their pediatrician. Um, now the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that all pediatricians do routine screening for developmental differences, including autism, specifically at both the 18 and 24 month checkup. And what's the difference between a educational and a medical diagnosis of autism? So when children are seen in a medical office with a doctor, um, they would be provided with a medical diagnosis of autism based on certain criteria. But if a child is receiving services from their school district, they would also have to meet the criteria set forth by their school district. Um, and their developmental differences would have to impact their ability to access the educational environment. And what are some of the greatest challenges you face with accurately diagnosing autism? I think probably the most difficult thing is that there is no specific medical test for autism. We really base it on observing the child's behavior and using our criteria for diagnosing autism to guide us. And why do you think you face those challenges? Um, well, I think there's still room for opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so some people might have different opinions on what they observe with a child. So we try to use some structured interviews and specific testing tools that help us to clarify the information. Okay. Thank you again. Faven, back to you. One of the most controversial and incorrect theories about autism is that it is caused by vaccines. Reporters Rachel Robertson, Ashley Lutz, and Danielle Wolf interviewed Dr. Paul Offit, an international expert on vaccinology. Dr. Paul Offit has spent years explaining the lack of connection between vaccines and autism. Vaccines don't cause autism. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institutes of Health agree. Offit directs the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and has published eight books, including Autism's False Prophets. Every epidemiological study that has looked at large numbers of children who either did or didn't get the MMR vaccine found that you are at no greater risk of getting autism if you got that vaccine or if you didn't. In 1998, Andrew Wakefield published a study concluding that children who received the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine more often exhibited symptoms of autism than children who did not receive the vaccine. The study was later retracted from the medical journal The Lancet, and Wakefield lost his medical license. Wakefield's publication led to what's now called the anti-vaxxer movement, an effort to allow parents to opt out of vaccines. As a result, vaccination rates have decreased. In California, they've dropped below vaccination rates in South Sudan. Sadly, the only way to, to get people to increase their, their interest in getting vaccines is to see these diseases come back. Offit links several outbreaks of previously eradicated diseases to decreasing vaccination rates. For example, a single outbreak of the measles at Disneyland in California has been traced to outbreaks in 24 states, two provinces in Canada, and Mexico. I think the single most important job for a parent is to put their child in the safest position possible. That's what vaccines do. Vaccines provide that safety. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Rachel Robertson with Ashley Lutz and Danielle Wolf reporting. Danielle, Ashley, and Rachel continued their research into the causes of autism. They spoke with the director of the Center for Applied Genomics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to explore the link between genetics, environment, and autism. Sometimes when gene and environmental 
factors such as toxins or something that comes from the environment works together, they amplify the risk. At the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Dr. Hakan Hakanarsen explains that those variants occur on multiple genes correlated with autism during the formation of the embryo. Despite this progress, an accurate genetic diagnostic test for autism may still be out of reach. And you may have all of these multiple variants and you may not have autism despite these variants, but they increase the risk. And then comes the environmental contributor that sort of triggers it. While a prenatal genetic screening may not provide an accurate diagnosis, such a test can provide some indication of their child's vulnerability to the disorder. You can sort of tell the parents that, you know, certain variants have been identified and therefore the risk of autism is highly elevated. Dr. Gong Yao of the University of Missouri explained how his lab identified differences in the way the pupils of young children with autism differed from those of typically developing children. Other researchers have also used eye tracking studies and found that children with autism as young as a few weeks old showed statistically different movement than that of typically developing children. Research continues to try to identify early indicators of autism. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Danielle Wolf with Ashley Lutz and Rachel Robertson reporting. Thanks, Danielle. After receiving a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, parents turned to a number of therapies for their children. Reporter Haley Moriello went to Chatham, New Jersey to visit a family with twins. For 11-year-old Danny and Rocco Knoll, their golden doodle sport is more than a family pet. A specially trained animal companion for children with autism spectrum disorder, sport is one of several therapies the Knolls use regularly. Early on, they used applied behavioral analysis, also known as ABA. This therapy works on a skill repetitively until it is mastered. So learning those basic skills, how to communicate and sit still and pay attention for a few minutes was next to impossible. And the ABA really helped with that. Now, Danny and Rocco use social skills classes, counseling, and occupational therapy. The Knowles Occupational Therapy takes place in what's called a sensory gym. Sonia Zayas was the family's main therapist for almost a decade. The sensory gym is very important because we believe that motor planning is very essential to adapting ourselves to life. Sonia uses an approach known as Relationship Development Intervention, or RDI, which focuses on the child's cognitive emotional development. They loved the comfort of us, but for the first three and a half years, Danny couldn't even say mom. He had a very hard time just looking you in the face. So that we had to really work on. Hope is the most important thing. You never give up hope. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Haley Moriello with Paula V. Kocher and Spencer Rouse reporting. HBO's movie Temple Grandin is based on the real-life story of a distinguished professor of animal sciences who is on the autism spectrum. Reporters Ben DeForest and Katherine Stevens traveled to Colorado State University to interview Professor Grandin. My autism allows me to understand prey animals well. I, I can visualize the flight zones of cattle. In this clip from the HBO film Temple Grandin, the title character demonstrates her unique ability to think visually. I am an extreme visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. And when I design something, I can actually test run it in my head. I didn't know that other people couldn't do this. But the fact that she could has been the key to Dr. Grandin's success. Today, she is responsible for the design of over half the livestock handling facilities in the United States and Canada. Her TED Talk has attracted more than 3 million views. And I get asked all the time, how did I get interested in cattle? I got interested in cattle because I was exposed to them when I was 15. I also had a wonderful science teacher. And he gave me lots of interesting projects to do. And that got me motivated in becoming a scientist. To help other children succeed, Grandin says schools need to create similar opportunities for students with autism spectrum disorders. When people get a diagnosis, usually they're good at one thing and bad at something else. We need to be building up on the thing that the kid is good at. It could be music, it could be art and design, it could be mathematics, it could be writing. Build on the thing they're good at so we can turn it into a career. An inventor, a best-selling author, and an advocate, Professor Grandin hopes to lead by example. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Ben DeForest with Katherine Stevens reporting. Individuals with autism are among those benefiting from communications technologies. Reporter Joanna Scotty went to Bucks County to see firsthand how technology helps local families. 
Karen Valachi, the Director of Technology for the Autism Cares Foundation, strives to educate teachers, parents, and children about the possibilities of technology. I have a son with autism, so I'm always trying to find things that I know can help him. Our son was always drawn to technology, and so we always tried to figure out how to use that to teach him because he was so motivated to want to use it. Karen searches through thousands of applications, hunting for resources. She says the most common and useful applications develop daily life skills. You're talking about life skills like making a bed, you know, chores that you might need to do around the house, but more importantly, preparing food. You don't realize how many steps there are involved in doing that. Karen says that one of the most important features for applications is the ability to customize the content to better suit a child's needs. Stefan has many applications that assist his independence as a nonverbal child and relies on his iPad and an application called Pro Quo To Go to communicate with his parents and peers. He can't express himself verbally, but receptively he understands. I need. This has given him a voice. Stefan's devices also allow him to participate in other activities, like sports and social events. For us, it has really provided a tremendous support system for him that allows us as a family to do all of the things that we would do if our child was typical. And through her work with Autism Cares, Karen hopes to bring more families together. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Joanna Scotty, reporting. We now turn to reporters Paul Gresham, Will Feldman, and Mike Giacco to learn another means through which some people with autism communicate. Imagine the frustration of not being able to communicate. Some people and their families struggle with this every day. We traveled to Washington, D.C. to learn about a type of communication used by people with autism. This technique is called Rapid Prompting Method, or RPM. For most of her life, people assume that because Camille Galli was nonverbal, she was low functioning. That all changed because of RPM. It's changed the way that I think about autism. Camille, to me, is just now somebody who has trouble communicating. The results came from four years of work with tutor Megan Pennington using RPM. Using RPM has allowed her to just be a teenager. She doesn't have to go to therapy all the time. She can express when she wants to try something new. We sat down with Camille to talk about her ability to communicate and the impact of RPM. It takes Camille about five minutes to respond, so we have condensed her answers in the interest of time. When asked what the best part about RPM was, she responded, when your words are taken seriously, not just by your family, but by the community. She took this one step further by stressing that there can be a lovely person with a lot you can learn from if RPM is an option. Camille's father, Joe, explained how RPM enhanced Camille's role in the Galli household. Now knowing she knows him, we have to watch everything we say. And um, I guess Camille's there to listen, hear, interpret, and pass a judgment. For some people with nonverbal autism, RPM has unlocked the ability to communicate. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Paul Gresham, Mike Giacco, and Will Feldman reporting. Finding effective ways to accommodate children with autism is a profound challenge. Reporter Bo Saunders tells us more. Cynthia Blasco began an autism support group. Parents and children in the group meet near Washington, socialize, and explore innovations in learning for kids with autism. What you will see is that we have a wide range. We have kids that are three to five years old, and then we have kids that are in their 20s, and some people who are even older than that, and some of them are in school situations where they're supported and some of them are in school situations where they're not supported. Tiffany Saunders is a resource teacher at St. Louis Catholic School and works with students with learning disabilities. She looks for creative ways to help students with ASD learn. Each child with or without autism is a unique learner. All of us learn uh, in different ways. Our, so our learning styles are as unique as our fingerprints. If a child with autism is on the spectrum that needs to communicate with a device, maybe the child is nonverbal, then yes, an accommodation would need to be made to have the child be able to communicate with his or her device. According to Mrs. Saunders, she believes that when teachers and parents alike come together, anything is possible in the classroom. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Bowden Saunders with Faven Magursa reporting. Since it first aired in 1969, Sesame Street has been a favorite children's program on our television screens. Reporters Danielle Sedillo and Jen Mignella went to PBS 39 in Bethlehem to learn more about one of the show's new friends. 
In 2015, Sesame Street introduced Julia, an online character with autism, as part of the initiative Sesame Street and Autism, See Amazing in All Children. Julia first appeared in the digital storybook, We're Amazing, 1, 2, 3. Dr. Terry Haddad is an Emmy Award-winning educational media producer at PBS 39 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We have a responsibility to make what we see on screen reflective of the community. A survey found that 63% of children with autism had been bullied at some time in their lives. The Sesame Street Initiative aims to make autism more familiar with children in an effort to reduce bullying. So our job as media professionals is to present the world as it is, and we try desperately to help present people in the most beautiful light. Reports show that children with autism learn well from visual media, so the writers at Sesame Street specifically created Julia as a digital character. Ultimately, every parent wants their child to be accepted. So if Julia helps to make children with neurological disabilities or disorders more accepted, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. For Lafayette Lens, this is Jen McNella with Danielle Sedillo reporting. Federal law requires schools to accommodate the educational needs of eligible students who have autism spectrum disorder. We spoke with Bruce Tenor, an autism support supervisor, to learn more about how this is implemented. The goal is for every child in our program to, to get a um, general education exposure with their typical peers. That's the way the law, the law reads. Some students are not ready for that, therefore they have to be in a more restrictive environment. Brick and mortar schools are not the only option for students with autism. Leslie McKelvey of Easton says her son Ty, who is entirely nonverbal, attends a cyber charter school and works from home with a professional aide using a computer and his assistive communication device. I think the kids with autism, and I know speaking for my son, is they're very rigid. So to watch my son be able to adapt and start to learn how to be flexible throughout his day is such a great quality that he is getting out of the cyber school. Leslie enjoys the ability to be more involved with her son's development. So if your speech therapist is working on, um, you know, building, building more words together, you get to watch that. You get to learn from that therapist firsthand. Whether in a classroom or behind the screen of a cyber school, federal law requires that all special needs students are provided FAPE, a free, appropriate public education. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Peter Levine with Laura Rowan reporting. Some young people with autism have limited options after high school. Reporters Hannah Doherty, Natalie Gosnell, and Sam Vail took a closer look at a program at Marywood University that helps to fill this gap. They call it the miracle of Marywood. I really don't know where he would be because um, I think at this point, I don't think there was a spot that would be a good fit for him. But Peggy Voice's son, Danny, found a good fit in a program called SOAR, which stands for Students on Campus Achieving Results, on the campus of Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's gone, gotten much more comfortable being outside of the house and interacting with strangers and, you know, other kids his age. The students become like rock stars on the campus. Uh, when we go places, everybody seems to, to know them. Dr. Patricia Arter founded the program to teach life skills to young adults with autism spectrum disorders. This program really came out of the fact that we had a lot of kids aging out of the system and not having any resources for them. Students spend the morning working on social and vocational skills. Every afternoon, they report to real jobs on campus. Dr. Arter reports many still face challenges finding work after graduation. We do have success cases, but in general, um, I don't I, we don't have enough supports out there for the students when they leave. Teachers report that students who graduate from the SOAR program still get jobs at a higher percentage rate than a student with autism spectrum disorder who did not attend the program. For Lafayette Lens, I'm Hannah Darty with Sam Vail and Natalie Gosnell reporting. Harrisburg addressed the cost of autism by passing a bill known as the Achieving a Better Life Experience Act or the ABLE Act. Joining us now in studio to learn more about the ABLE Act is Katherine Stevens and two special guests. Thanks, Faven. The ABLE Act allows families to save money to pay for disability-related expenses without jeopardizing their eligibility for other important government programs. I'm here with Democratic Representative Robert Freeman and Republican Senator Pat Brown, who are co-sponsors of the Pennsylvania ABLE Act. Gentlemen, welcome to Lafayette Lens. Thank you. Thanks for having us. 
We will start this discussion with a question for Senator Brown. What was the inspiration for this bill on a national level? Well, I think it came from the success of the college savings plan. There was a recognition that people using def deferred money from taxes to save for college to allow them to pay for those expenses was a very successful program. When they originally conceived that, they were considering a program for people and citizens with disabilities and their expenses, but it was never completed. And actually, our senator, uh, Bob Casey, was the inspiration to put it into federal law, but it required state action to implement it at the state level, and that's what we just accomplished. Now, Representative Freeman, why did the state government of Pennsylvania choose to get involved? Well, one of the features of the federal law was to require the states to actually do the implementation and to administer the programs, as they do with the 529 um, college tuition programs as well. So there was a need for enabling legislation on the state level to carry through the intent of the federal legislation. This next question is for both of you. You two each come from different parties. What about this bill brought you each together in your support? Well, I think it services for people with disabilities is something uh, that people across party lines, members of the assembly, understand is a core function of government. We do a lot of investment within our department's uh, education for students with special needs, human services for uh, citizens with disabilities, and an interest in providing self-sufficiency is something that we collectively share, and this was something that would lead to that. So there was obviously broad support for this. Yeah, I think Pat's right. Uh, there's a, a clear recognition in both parties, all the caucuses that make up the legislature, that this was an issue that we needed to, to really uh, move forward. Had strong bipartisan support. It passed both chambers unanimously uh, and was recognized as uh, taking care of a critical need. There are so many people uh, who have disabilities who, because of the nature of so many programs, are limited in the amount of income they can actually have. And this is one way to supplement that income through a tax-free uh, savings plan. Well, thank you both for joining us on Lafayette Lens. Faven, back to you. Services for autism spectrum disorder can be very costly. Reporter Will Gordon explains more about these costs. $137 billion. That's how much autism costs society each year, according to a 2010 study funded by Autism Speaks. A recent report predicts that by 2025, autism alone will cost the U.S. more than diabetes or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. For many, these costs hit home. Joseph Schieber is a professor at Lafayette College and the parent of Noah, his one-year-old daughter, and Sam, his five-year-old son with autism. He understands the costs. One of the biggest costs, according to Schieber? Well, for me, I would definitely say time. Other costs can include individualized therapies, special education, nutritional supplements, and respite care. Scott Campbell, a consultant, advocate, and parent of an 18-year-old with autism named Ian, said that annual costs for families can range from ten dollars to $100,000 a year. And how much of that is an out-of-pocket expense also varies. Doug Leslie is a professor at the Penn State College of Medicine. He studies the cost of health care as it relates to autism. So we did a study a couple of years ago that compared the costs of services under private insurance and Medicaid and found that the services were actually quite a bit better under Medicaid. State spending on Medicaid varies, according to Professor Leslie's 2012 study, with the 2003 average expenditures ranging from $8,000 per child in Illinois to $47,000 per child in North Carolina. He found that, as a whole, states' Medicaid waiver programs covered more ADA-specific services than private insurers. Some states, they have a reputation for having a particularly generous waiver, and you'll see parents will relocate. I think that we were very lucky that we had good financial supports from private insurance. Autism is not only a medical issue, but also an economic one. For Lafayette Lens, this is William Gordon reporting. Thank you for watching this edition of Lafayette Lens. As we say goodbye, we'll show a performance by Colin Siddons, a young man with autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm.